Good morning. Glad to see those of you who made it this morning. I'm not quite sure what happened to other people this morning. It's amazing when there's stuff like the night before, like there's a fight on or something like that. By the way, how much money did all the people that paid for the fight, watched the fight, stayed up late, how much money did they make from that? Zero. Yeah, it's amazing the things that we prioritize. But anyways, I appreciate you guys being here this morning and, and uh, ready to go and ready to worship. We're actually talking about a very important subject. Turn me down just a little bit if you can. Thank you. Don't want to hear that all morning. I'll get it off of my uh, chest here. Oh, there we go. Um, we're, we're discussing today, as we continue in the battle within, about the area of addictions. Now, that's a very important area. You know, there are many more addictions that we have than we even realize. You go up to a typical person today and you say to them, do you have any addictions that you battle? And some would say yes. And some would say, oh, no, I don't have any, any addictions. And they think of just certain things, like maybe drug addiction, alcohol addiction, or things like that. But there are many other things when it comes to the area of addiction that really occupy and dominate our life. I mean, it's the simple, obvious ones that I can think of. For instance, how many of you have ever been in a bowling league? Raise your hand if you've ever been in a bowling league. All right, several of us. And when I first started in bowling leagues, for instance, they didn't have rules uh, way back. They didn't have rules about not smoking in the building. Now, in bowling leagues, notorious for smoking. And so there'd be a lot of people that would do that. Then they changed that rule in the state of California, where not only in restaurants, but in any, any public place inside, you couldn't smoke, right? And so one of the most awkward things that I noticed was if there's a smoker on your team or if you're bowling a team that has a smoker. It's very annoying. Because all of a sudden you'll look for them and it's their turn. And of course, over the course of a bowling night, three games, sometimes four to five people on a team, this is a two to three hour process for three games. And you'll be waiting all the time for this person because they're outside. Because they can't get through the game without having to go outside and do that. And I remember thinking to myself, I thought, Man, I'm really glad in this particular case that I don't have that, that situation because I would want to just enjoy bowling the game and not have to be where I had to go outside and, and had to do this almost like I had no choice to do that several times within a particular night. These are the addictions that we think of, that we think of addictions like physical things that draw a person and, and a person does and they'll tell you that they can't help and, and there's much of the mind that even says that and much of the body that even says that. But addictions go far beyond even that. So we're going to look at some of them this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious God, may you bless, may you uh, guide in the words that are said today, may you uh, show us through your scripture uh, the things that you have for us. And Father, may we allow the control of our life to be through and only through you, your spirit. We commit this to you. May you grab our attention. May you focus us in here, Father, and give you the honor and worship that you deserve. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at addictions that we're going to show up here on the screen, there are many things that come to mind, but let's give a, a basic definition. This is not necessarily a biblical definition, but this is one that's often given. A state in which an organism, in this case human being, engages in a compulsive behavior. A behavior that is reinforcing, in the sense that it's rewarding or pleasurable, at least in the person's mind, a loss of control when it comes to limiting that intake. And this is the traditional definition that people think of when it comes to an addiction. So in other words, they would tell you that there's literally a loss of control when it comes to that intake. Question or point? Jill? Oh, I was 
Oh yeah, there's all kinds. So that's what we'll, we'll, we'll go over all those today. There's all kinds of things. You know, people think traditionally of this, something that becomes what they call physically habit forming. But addictions go way beyond that. So let's put the next screen up and we'll see some others here. So, so there's all kinds of things. So for instance, today it's more than just those things. And you notice the guy up on the right, this is what addictions tend to do. And I, I've listed just a small list here of addictions. Some of those you would think of, and some of those you would not think of. But these are all things that become very addictive. So for instance, the internet. I confess, I'm in big trouble when it comes to that, okay? Because I do everything with the internet. When the internet is down, I am like, lost. Because almost everything I do, a lot of it is connected. Everything I look up, everything I research, everything, even trying to, for instance, get the PowerPoint slides for this morning, I transported that over. I don't use a, a thing for that. I just do it by email and I use the internet. When the internet goes down, I'm in big trouble. But many of us spend many, many hours some things, on things like the internet. Add gaming into that. Sorry, some of you who like gaming and games and everything. People don't just play games anymore. We used to play video games, but now it requires, am I right, Noah? It requires the internet, right, Elijah? Right? It requires that. Because you're not just playing against the computer. You're not just playing against, you're going over the internet and you're playing people all over the place. And man, you want to get some people mad? Pull the plug. Or let there be a, 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 an outage all of a sudden, right in the midst of one of your best games, and all of a sudden there's an outage. It's like, it's like the state of the universe has just fallen apart. And it dominates all of our time. Do you know there are many students today who have trouble completing their work and their homework? I'm not going to name any, because there's many. Okay, some would say, oh, you're talking to me. No, I'm talking to a lot of people. This is, by the way, why I don't play video games anymore. I love video games. I love them. And I know that if I were to plug one in today, because I know me, I'll get no sleep. Because all the things that I still need to do and need to function, I'll still need to get up and do but I don't like losing, and I always want to play one more game, and I'll be up till 3, 4 in the morning, and even when I go to bed at 4 in the morning, it will be reluctantly. It doesn't matter if I have to get up at 6.30. I'll have every intention of going to bed at midnight, and before you know it, it'll be 3.30 or 4 a.m. Because it just dominates. Now, is there any, think about that, is there any physical thing which would require me and force me to stay up till 3.30 or 4 a.m. You know, people go, oh, things have become addicting. Well, it's enslaving. Your body has to have it. That's not true on something like that, right? That's not true on something like the internet. That's not true on something like gambling. Some people are workaholics. They work all the time. That's all they ever do. And they just can't do anything but work, 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 work. And it almost becomes compulsive behavior. All right? The one on the bottom, we've talked about that for the last couple of weeks, so I'm not going to go back there. But what about shopping? Are there shopaholics, by the way? There are some people that you can't get them out of the store. They're such compulsive shoppers, right? They, they, um, they, why, why do they have end caps in stores? You notice end caps if you've ever worked in retail? And on the end, end cap is on the end of an aisle. It'll be a featured item. They'll also have in, uh, items that are by their register that are there for a reason. And what will that reason be? Yeah, you'll impulsively, you just can't stand to see a bargain, right? You'll walk into Walmart or places like that and it'll say roll back. And they'll have all these little things, right? And all these little impulsive items that'll be there. Okay, these are all types of little things that we have that our behavior is often out of control. And then on the bottom one there, I'm not going to talk about that, but I listed it. 
Because that is a big, big, huge one today that causes a lot of addiction, addictive type of behavior. That even some of the most well-meaning of Christians will find themselves wrapped up in that. So let's move on and let's look at some verses this morning. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Now we've been talking, of course, in our series about being led by the Spirit, that you would not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the two are contrary, and you'd end up doing the things that you don't want. Paul, who wrote those verses, God used him to write those verses, also wrote this. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, And he makes a very important point. And although it is in the context of sexual immorality, it also applies to many other things as well. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So, for instance, going back to my video game example. Is there any verse in Scripture that would say that it would be wrong in and of itself to play a video game if it's just an innocent video game? No, No, there's nothing in Scripture that says that. Noah's like quickly going, yeah, there's nothing in Scripture that says that. It does not say in commandment number 11, thou shalt not play video games past 1 a.m. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. There's a lot of things in life that are not inherently wrong in and of themselves, but they might not be good for you. See, the issue here is what controls our life? What takes control? There are many people, for instance, that are just controlled by whatever the world is doing. Case in point this morning, whenever there's a special event on a Saturday night, they're missing the next day. Because instead of God controlling them, And God being the ultimate control and the spirit controlling their life, they're controlled by whatever whim is taking place and whatever everyone else is doing. By the way, I'm not, obviously not getting on any of you because you're here. Yeah, you're still here, right? (laughs) By by the way, what time was the fight? Like 9 9 p.m.? Right. So it ended at 10 o'clock. It ended at 10 o'clock, right? So yeah. But of course there's all the ritualistic thing. Everybody has to do everything else afterwards and all that kind of stuff. All right? So you've got all that. So that's another example. Okay? What ends up controlling and becoming the predominant thing in our Life. There's a lot of things that are lawful. So for instance, does it say, if there's a fight on, thou shalt not watch it and shalt not gather with friends? It does not say that. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. But then the question has to become, and we have to be asking ourselves, and Paul fought this battle all the time, there are many things that he could do, But in his case, there were many things that were not necessarily beneficial to him. And the main thing that he looked at was, well, anything bring, he will not be brought under the power of anything except for Christ. So for instance, up there in the picture that I had before was an example of, I put gambling. Now, if I go to Las Vegas... There were some that there were some that say that no Christian should ever find themselves in Las Vegas. You can't find that in Scripture, guys. I'm sorry, it's not there. Exactly. 
And the stuff that you can find in Vegas, you can find in other places as well, and it's not some magical thing. I can go to Las Vegas and do a lot of great things. I've been there many times. Melody had many a tournament in basketball, and, and what was I going to do? Say, sorry, Mel, I'm not going to go watch your games because it's in Las Vegas. There's nothing in Scripture that says I can't go to Las Vegas, but what do I do when I get there? That's the question. And years ago, when the, one of the first times I went to Vegas as an adult, as, as, as 21 years of age, I went down just to play an innocent little thing, this innocent little deuces wild computer poker thing or whatever that was on there, and we played with nickels. It was just for fun. And wouldn't you know it, some of you already know the story, but wouldn't you know it that as I played that Deuces Wild, Val was right there with me, and I played that Deuces Wild, which means that twos count as whatever you want them to be, we got four twos. So I mean, some people go, well, what was the fifth card? It really doesn't matter, right? Because the twos became whatever that fifth card was. They're wild. They could be whatever. So we had five of a kind. How many people wait for that? Of course, we only put in two nickels. What a drag. 18 bucks. So we're looking at that, right? And we're thinking, man, what if we had put in five? Oh, look, it would have been like $600. And what if we, what if we weren't being so cheap? Of course, we only had like 40 bucks with us for the whole weekend. We were just broke. But what if we had played the quarter things on the same machine. What if? So, so anyway, so, so we go up to the room. Val's always liked her sleep. So she's snoring away, sleeping no problem. But I can't stand it. I just can't stand it. I'm up thinking about this thing, right? Man, I can't believe we got four. It's just a matter of time. We did it once. We can do it again. I know I can. And so all this is going through my head. I mean, I've never done this stuff before, and all of a sudden it's like a craving, it's like a desire, it's like it's a strong thing. It's like, man, i got to get back down there. I know i got 20 bucks in my wallet right now. Let me go get a roll of quarters. i got to get back down there. So like I was telling people in Sunday school class, if I ever want Val to say yes to something, all i got to do is just ask her when she's half asleep. So, so I, I, I wake up, Val, huh? <laughs> hey, um, if you don't mind, I can't sleep. Didn't tell her why. Um, I can't sleep, so I'm, I'm going to go back down and just play that little machine again. All right. Out. There I am. So I go down with my 20 bucks, get my roll of quarters. I'm ready to win my 5,000 bucks and all this kind of stuff. And there I am going through that. And, of course, how much of that 20 bucks did I have left when I was done? Zero. Zero. So there I am now scrounging through the casino, looking around like a bum. Somebody had to drop something somewhere. I'm following people, you know, looking everywhere that they're playing. Somebody must have dropped a quarter somewhere. You know, it's just trying to find some way to, to get more money, to try to get it back. Thinking to myself, it's a good thing I didn't have more money. Because if I had, I realized if I had more money at that point, I would have done it. And afterwards, when it all calmed down, I thought to myself, what in the world just happened? I mean, literally, I was like out of control quick. And I realized at that point in time, look, this is something I need to not do. Now, can someone go and just play something like that for fun, just for the mere entertainment? Yeah. You can't sit there and find a scriptural verse. Where people do other things just for entertainment. But when it becomes gambling and when it becomes a big thing and when it becomes something that starts taking a mastery over you, that's a problem. And that's how it would be for me if I would go do that. So for years after that, Melodies, tournaments, different things like that. Even now for company conventions, I'll walk through casinos. I don't even think about it. I don't even consider stopping. Because I don't want to do it. Because I know it can very easily be a mastery over me if I'm not careful. So that's when it becomes a big issue. So we have to be careful of things that become addictions in our life. And there are things that can very easily become addictions Things that can very easily, and God will start to, to point those things out to you. There are some things that are tempting for some and not tempting for others, and it varies by person. 
But Paul said, I will not be brought under the power of any. So if there's anything that starts to bring us under the power of it, we need to put that in check with God. Let's move on to the next verse. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, we looked at this briefly last week. I just want to review it real briefly. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, who is supposed to be controlling our life? The Spirit. It, you know, it's actually okay if you want it. I've heard people use the phrase, addicted to Jesus. It's maybe not the greatest phrase, but when you think about it, it's actually, the concept is all right. It's an issue of control. And if there's anything and anyone that is supposed to be definitely controlling us, we're supposed to yield control of our life to the Spirit of God. And as we're controlled by the Spirit of God, notice what it says our life will be like. We'll speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. Does that look like a, uh, a stressed out, messed up, drama-filled person? Or does that look like a happy person? Happy person. You see, when we're battling other things in our life, that's when all the other stuff comes in. When there's other stuff that starts to take control in our life, that's when all the other stuff comes in. Some of us are walking soap operas. I'm serious. There's like a problem every day. And God wants to change that. God wants to start making it where we're actually walking around making melody in our heart to the Lord. I mean, that may sound a little weird, but in other words, where's the focus of that person's mind? That, person, that focus of that person's mind isn't a, I have this problem, I got this problem, this is wrong, this is wrong. Hey, we all got that. I'll tell you that. If I want to focus on my problems, give me 48 hours for a 24-hour day because I got plenty of them. And then add on everyone else's problems and then I need more time. But when we want to focus on the Spirit of God, what will start happening is all our thought processes starts to change because all this addictive stuff, by the way, it's in the head more than anywhere else, just so you know that. We like to blame and say, oh, my body this, my, I can't help it. That's nonsense in most cases. It's more in the head of what we're thinking and what we've chosen to believe at this point and where control of our life is going than anything else. Okay? So we're supposed to be controlled by the Spirit. Now, how do we do that? We do that by spending time with who? God. God. Prayer. Word of God, looking at his word, reading it, meditating on it, day and night, Psalms 1 tells us. Putting that as the focus of our mind. Your prayer time shouldn't be just what we pray on Sunday or on Wednesday. It should be daily. It should be regular. It shouldn't be, oh, well, I did my 10 minutes of prayer this morning. Are you kidding? That's not enough. We're to be praying without ceasing, the Bible says. Oh, well, I read my five-minute little Bible passage. We're supposed to be meditating on it day and night. When we're doing that and we're yielding control of the Spirit of God and not quenching the Spirit, then our whole outlook, everything starts to change. Our whole life, our whole attitude, everything starts to change. And that's what the focus becomes on. So let's move on to the next one. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29. What is the answer to addictions? I mean, there's so many addictions I could go into today. And, they're so, and many of them are so difficult. And trust me, I approach that with compassion. But what is the answer? You know, many people approach addictions completely wrong. They approach them from a my mind willpower standpoint. Okay, so for instance, let's say that I'm addicted to calories, which I am, by the way. Anyone in here like to eat? You can admit it. I love eating. Most people that I meet, skinny or not skinny, love eating. Even skinny people love eating. They just repress it. That's why we have things, what is the biggest market, what is the biggest word that you see in the marketplace today? Diet. If we didn't love eating so much, there wouldn't be such a need for diets. 
Even if you don't need to lose weight, what is it that they emphasize on just feeling better when you go to the doctor? Well, have you watched your diet? What is it that you're intaking? What is it that you're doing? We love food. When we go on a diet, how many times do diets work? Usually they don't. Because this is the way a typical diet works, right? You modify your behavior for a period of time, and then when that period of time is over, which you did through willpower and basically hating every second of it, when that period is over, what, do you, what happens? You gain it back, plus some. And the reason you gain it back is because you go back See, you never changed. All you did was modify your behavior for a period of time. And then you are still the same person, and so you go back to doing the same things, which gets you the same result, if not more so. Correct? How many of you have clothes like I do that you can't fit into, but you refuse to get rid of them in the case of the day when you may fit into them again. How sad is it that, by the way, this is one thing you should probably do, I don't do it. When I do lose weight and my clothes become too big, which has happened like one occasion in my lifetime, I should have got rid of those bigger clothes because now they fit just fine. In fact, they're a little snug. That's not good, okay? Because the person didn't really change. They even say, well, if you do something for 90 days, it becomes a new habit, and it becomes, ah, not necessarily. If you don't change. See, the answer to addictions is not to resist it, but then you don't really change. The answer is to go to the one who can change you and allow him to make you a different person. Here it tells us right here, to the person that's struggling, to the person that's tired, to the person that's having a hard time, to the person that's, that's battling things. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hey, the addicted person is tired. They're tired of fighting. They're tired of struggling. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. The yoke, I mean, if you look at that, when the yoke with an animal that would be hooked up and it would pull the animal, the, the yoke is what would control the whole movement and the whole direction of everything. Jesus says, let me take control of your life. Let me be the one that pulls you along instead of you trying to do it. Let me be the one who takes on the load. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. This is the only way where we find true rest. There are many things that people struggle with for years. Habits that they struggle with for years. Disappointment, depression, alcohol use, drug use. Different habits that they fall into. And yet, they fall into them over and over again. Because they may resist for a while, but there needs to be a true change that takes place in a person's life. And it takes place through Jesus Christ. The next verse will show us this. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So it'll be a person and they come to Jesus Christ and the devil will still come along and say, you know what, you have always struggled with this and that's what you will always be. There are some people, for instance, that say once an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. Personally, I don't believe that. I don't believe that scriptural. I think in the person's head and if they believe that, I think that's true. But I don't believe, biblically, that that is really the case. I think they've just chosen to believe that it's the case. Whether it's that or whether it's anything else. 
the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, has the ability and the power, the one who's made us, to change us, to make us new. And no matter what it is, whatever behavior that we're constantly struggling with, as we surrender that over to God, I'm not saying it's just a snap, but he can change it. As we are walking in the Spirit, as we've talked about in this particular series, when we are walking in the Spirit, we will not what? Fulfill what? The lust of the flesh. It's the flesh that causes us to battle with addictions. But when we are walking with the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you may say some of those things I've listed today, oh, you know, I, I do... I do get over those for a period of time, but ultimately, I end up struggling with them again. Well, ask yourself this question. At the times that you're struggling with those particular things, are you walking with the Spirit of God in those moments? And I'm sure the answer is no. That's why we need to be dependent upon the Spirit of God throughout every day of the rest of our life. D.L. Moody, the great famous evangelist, when he talked about being led and filled with the Spirit of God, he said, we are leaky vessels. In other words, we'll be filled with that Spirit one day, but we have to keep going to Him daily on a regular basis to maintain that. We have all the Spirit of God that we need as far as our salvation, but we need to constantly be going to Him and yielding to Him on a daily basis. Because you don't overcome addictive behavior with willpower. You overcome it by allowing God to make you a new and different person, more and more like Jesus Christ every single day. Let's go to the next slide. And that's the key. We're going to sing this right now at the end. As we close this message today, you might be here today and you're struggling with some area that has mastery over you. It may be what some people traditionally consider to be addictive. If I were to ask you to come up here one by one, and name for everybody what it is so that they could pray for you, more than likely most of us would not be willing or comfortable in doing that. If we were to do that, and we were truly confessing what our addictive behaviors are one by one in front of this room, more than likely the majority of the rest of us would be extremely surprised. But the truth of the matter is that whatever it is that you struggle with and have struggled with more than likely repeatedly for years at this point can only be dealt with through surrendering constantly to the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ. And that comes with surrendering and yielding that over to Him. So as we bow our our heads and close our eyes, Let me ask you, have you sincerely ever really asked God to take that away from you? I would submit to you that the answer is probably most of the time, no. You ask God in your weakness to help you with it, but in reality you love it too much. You ask him to help you with it for a period of time to help you to refrain from it. But if you ever asked him to change you, to make you different, to make it so that you don't even desire that anymore, He wants you today to say, Lord, sincerely, I want to surrender it to you.
Whatever it is. He knows what it is. You know what it is. I don't need to know what it is. You and God already know. Ask Him to change you. Ask Him today to make whatever that is so disgusting in your head that you don't even desire it anymore. And to make that permanent. Because you want to be controlled by His Spirit and you want to be yielding your life and living for Him and not be mastered by anything else that would control your life instead. Father God, I pray for each person that's here this morning. I thank you for them. I thank you that you brought us here to worship you, to look at your word together. Father, we are here today and we are all weak in and of ourselves. In our own flesh, Father, we cannot change the things that have plagued us throughout our life. We pray for a sincere heart to come before you today and to trust in the power of your Spirit, yielding ourselves to you and surrendering to you now those things. May it be sincere from our heart. Not a desire to restrain, but a desire to be transformed. Not a desire to to resist only, but to lose all taste whatsoever for whatever it is. We would commit this to you and ask that you allow us to help surrender all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close the service, well, actually, as we get ready for communion, what a perfect song that we have this morning. And actually, as we prepare for communion, we'll take right now, if you're sitting in the side section, it'd be awesome if you can move into the center. Makes it easier for serving. And as we sing the words of this song, may be true in light of what we have said today, of what we've looked at today. to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence That as you cannot overcome addictive behavior in your life without the Spirit of Christ, you cannot have the Spirit of Christ in your life without knowing Jesus Christ. Without coming to the point where you acknowledge your helplessness to go to heaven 
on your own without acknowledging your sin before him and asking for forgiveness of that sin and repenting or turning from that sin. Without belief that Jesus Christ died for you and died for your sin on the cross and paid the price for it through the shedding of his blood. And that he then not only gave himself for you but rose again. If you're here today without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, You are helpless to overcome and to be changed. The addictions, oh, you can modify your behavior for a while. You can fight things and you can try to be a better person. But you're helpless to have the true answer to change not only those behaviors, but to pass from death unto life. So if you're here today, before any of those other things can be taken care of, we would encourage you to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ by saying, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I do believe that Jesus died for me. I do believe that he rose again. I do believe that he died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. I ask forgiveness for my sins. So that I might have victory over sin which leads to death. And instead I might have life. I place my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you're doing that or you need to do that, that is the first step to being a new creation. You can't be one on your own. And then as that takes place, then he'll start to change everything else. And if you're still here and you didn't pray that prayer but you need help with that, I'd encourage you to come after the service and see me or someone else so that we can sit down and pray with you in that area. But let's sing the one more verse. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine, may thy Holy Spirit fill me, may I know thy power divine. And I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. time it is to have communion this morning. I'm going to ask those who are serving to come forward for that. For communion is definitely a time of remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He became the Passover lamb the ultimate perfect Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. And as he established this Lord's Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me until I come. In addition to it being a time of remembrance, it's also a time, the Bible tells us, of examination. A time for us to humbly put ourselves before God and say, God, may you reveal anything that I need to surrender over to you as we just sang. May I not come and take and partake of your communion unworthy with sin that I'm hiding in my heart, with things that I refuse to give up. But instead, Father, may I surrender all before you, just as you gave your all for me on the cross. Jesus was willing to take our entire sin upon himself on the cross. And as we think about what he did for us, giving his body and the shedding of his blood, Before we partake of what he did for us, isn't it only right, isn't it only true that we should 
in our hearts give everything that is a stumbling block or a sin in our heart right now over to him and ask his forgiveness before partaking of communion. So I would encourage you to do that right now, right where you sit. Because realize that the elements that you're going to hold in your hand and what it represents was a God who loved you so much that he gave everything. He held nothing back. He took on our sin and a punishment that he did not deserve so that you and I might have life. And in so doing, all those who have placed their faith and trust in him now have life through his name. And it's that that we celebrate when we partake of communion. And you do not need to be a member of First Baptist Church of El Monte to take of communion, although most of you are. But you need to be a member of his true church. You say, well, who's a member of his true church? Well, those who have said yes. I know that I am forgiven because I have placed my faith in the one who has forgiven me. And that is Jesus Christ. And if that is the case, we encourage you to partake of communion today. If that is not yet the case, then we encourage you to call upon him, the Lord of heaven, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who has given his all for you so that you may not go another day not having that life. On the day or the evening that Jesus was betrayed, the Bible tells us that he took bread Austin, would you ask the Lord's blessing on the bread, please? Dear God, um, right now we come before you and we we remember um, your son. We remember that Jesus Christ um, came down from heaven and took on flesh, humbled himself, took on flesh, and became obedient, obedient even to the point of death, and the death on the cross. Your son took our place and died for us, taking our sin upon himself. And this is what we remember now. We remember the punishment you poured out on him that should have been ours. We remember the pain, the blood that was pouring off his back and on and out of his wounds. And he did that all for us. And that's what we remember now, God. And so as we remember this, I pray, dear Lord, that you will help us to examine ourselves, to see the sin that is in our heart, and to repent of it, to turn away from our sins, and to turn towards you, to seek you with our whole heart, with all that we have. God, please search our hearts. Find those sins that are hidden. Find those sins that are hidden 